This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of the Spirit and the Life of Today by Evelyn Underhill. Chapter 3, Part B Psychology and the Life of the Spirit. 1. The Analysis of Mind. This, then, is the real business of conversion, and of the character-building that succeeds it, the harnessing of instinct to idea, and its direction into new and more lofty channels of use, transmuting the turmoil of man's merely egotistic ambitions, anxieties, and emotional desires into fresh forms of creative energy, and transferring their interest from narrow and unreal to universal objectives. The seven deadly sins of Christian ethics— Pride, anger, envy, avarice, sloth, gluttony, and lust represent not so much deliberate wrongfulness as the outstanding forms of man's uncontrolled and self-regarding instincts. Unbridled self-assertion, ruthless acquisitiveness, and undisciplined indulgence of sense. The traditional evangelical virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience, which sum up the demands of the spiritual life, exactly oppose them. Over against the self-assertion of the proud and angry is set the idea of humble obedience, with its wise suppleness and abnegation of self-will. Over against the acquisitiveness of the covetous and envious is set the ideal of inward poverty, with its liberation from the narrow self-interest of I, me, and mine. Over against the sensual indulgence of the greedy, lustful, and lazy is set the idea of chastity, which finds all creatures pure to enjoy, since it sees them in God, and God in all creatures. Yet all this, rightly understood, is no mere policy of repression. It is rather a rational policy of release, freeing for higher activities instinctive force too often throw away. It is giving the wild beast his work to do, training him. Since the instincts represent the efforts of this urgent life in us to achieve self-protection and self-realization, it is plain that the true regeneration of the psyche, its redirection from lower to higher levels, can never be accomplished without their help. We only rise to the top of our powers when the whole man acts together, urged by an enthusiasm or an instinctive need. Further, a complete and ungraduated response to stimulus, an all-or-none reaction, is characteristic of the instinctive life and of the instinctive life alone. Those whom it rules for the time give themselves wholly to it, and so display a power far beyond that of the critical and the controlled. Thus fear or rage will often confer abnormal strength and agility. A really dominant instinct is a veritable source of psychophysical energy, unifying and maintaining in vigor all the activities directed to its fulfillment. 74. A young man in love is stimulated not only to emotional ardor, but also to hard work in the interests of the future home. The explorer develops amazing powers of endurance. The inventor in the ecstasy of creation draws on deep vital forces, and may carry on for long periods without sleep or food. If we apply this law to the great examples of the spiritual life, we see in the vigor and totality of their self-giving to spiritual interests a mark of instinctive action, and in the power the indifference to hardship which these selves develop, the result of unification of an all-or-none response to the religious or philanthropic stimulus. It helps us to understand the cheerful austerities of the true ascetic, the superhuman achievement of St. Paul, little hindered by the thorn in the flesh, the career of St. Joan of Arc, the way in which St. Teresa or St. Ignatius, tormented by ill health, yet brought their great conceptions to birth the powers of resistance displayed by George Fox and other Quaker saints. It explains Mary Slessor living and working barefoot and bareheaded under the tropical sun, disdaining the use of mosquito nets, eating native food, and taking with impunity the daily risks fatal to the average European. 75. It shows us, too, why the great heroes of the spiritual life so seldom think out their positions, or husband their powers. They act because they are impelled, often in defiance of all prudent considerations, yet commonly with an amazing success. Thus General Booth has said that he was driven by the impulses and urgings of an undying ambition to save souls. 
What was this impulse and urge? It was the instinctive energy of a great nature in a sublimated form. The level at which this enhanced power is experienced will determine its value for life, but its character is much the same in the convert at a revival, in the postulant's vivid sense of vocation and the consequent break with the world, in the disinterested man of science consecrated to search for truth, and in the apostle's self-giving to the service of God with the answering gift of new strength and fruitfulness. Its secret, and indeed the secret of all transcendence, is implied in the direction of the old English mystic. Mean God all, all God, so that naught may work in thy wit and in thy will, but only God. 76. The overbelief, the religious formula in which this instinctive passion is expressed, is comparatively unimportant. The revivalist, wholly possessed by concrete and anthropomorphic ideas of God which are impossible to a man of different and, as we suppose, superior education, can yet, because of the burning reality with which he lives towards the God so strangely conceived, infect those with whom he comes in contact with the spiritual life. We are now in a position to say that the first necessity of the life of the spirit is the sublimation of the instinctive life, involving the transfer of our interest and energy to new objectives, the giving of our old vigor to new longings and new loves. It appears that the invitation of religion to a change of heart, rather than a change of belief, is founded on solid psychological laws. I need not dwell on the way in which divine love, as the saints have understood it, answers to the complete sublimation of our strongest natural passion, or the extent in which the highest experiences of the religious life satisfy man's instinctive craving for self-realization within a greater reality, how he feels himself to be fed with a mysterious food, quickened by a fresh dower of life, assured of his own safety within a friendly universe, given a new objective for his energy. It is notorious that one of the most striking things about a truly spiritual man is that he has achieved a certain stability which others lack. In him the central craving of the psyche for more life and more love has reached its bourne, instead of feeding upon those secondary objects of desire which may lull our restlessness but cannot heal it. He loves the thing which he ought to love, wants to do the deeds which he ought to do, and finds all aspects of his personality satisfied in one objective. Every one has really a forced option between the costly effort to achieve this sublimation of impulse this unification of the self on spiritual levels, and the quiet evasion of it, which is really a capitulation to the animal instincts and unordered cravings of our many-leveled being. We cannot stand still, and this steady downward pull keeps us ever in mind of all the backward-tending possibilities collectively to be thought of as sin, and explains to us why sloth, lack of spiritual energy, is held by religion to be one of the capital forms of human wrongness. I go on to another point, which I regard as of special importance. It must not be supposed that the life of the spirit begins with the sublimation of the instinctive and emotional life. This is indeed for it a central necessity. Nor must we take it for granted that the apparent redirection of impulse to spiritual objects is always and inevitably in advance. All who are, or may be concerned with the spiritual training, help, and counseling of others, ought to clearly recognize that there are elements in religious experience which represent, not a true sublimation, but either disguised primitive cravings and ideas, or uprushes from lower instinctive levels. For these experiences have their special dangers. As we shall see when we come to their more detailed study, devotional practices tend to produce that state which psychologists call mobility of the threshold of consciousness, and may easily permit the emergence of natural inclinations and desires, of which the self does not recognize the real character. As a matter of fact, a good deal of religious emotion is of this kind. Instances are the childish longing for mere protection, for a sort of supersensual petting, the excessive desire for shelter and rest, voiced in too many popular hymns, the subtle form of self-assertion which can be detected in some claims to intercourse with God, e.g. the celebrated conversation of Angela of Foligno with the Holy Ghost, 77, the thinly veiled human feelings which find expression in the personal raptures of a certain type of pious literature, 
and in what has been well described as the divine duet type of devotion. Many, though not all, of the supernormal phenomena of mysticism are open to the same suspicion, and the Church's constant insistence on the need of submitting these to some critical test before accepting them at face value is based on a most wholesome skepticism. Though a sense of meek dependence on enfolding love and power is the very heart of religion, and no intense spiritual life is possible unless it contain a strong emotional element, it is of first importance to be sure that its effective side represents a true sublimation of human feelings and desires, and not merely an oblique indulgence of lower cravings. Again, we have to remember that the instinctive self, powerful though it be, does not represent the sum total of human possibility. The maximum of man's strength is not reached until all the self's powers, the instinctive and also the rational, are united and set on one objective, for then only is he safe from the insidious inner conflict between natural craving and conscious purpose which saps his energies, and is welded into a complete and harmonious instrument of life. The source of power, says Dr. Hadfield in The Spirit, lies not in instinctive emotion alone but in instinctive emotion expressed in a way with which the whole man can, for the time being at least, identify himself. Ultimately this is impossible without the achievement of a harmony of all the instincts and the approval of reason. 78. Thus we see that any unresolved conflict or divorce between the religious instinct and the intellect will mar the full power of the spiritual life, and that an essential part of the self's readjustment to reality must consist in the uniting of these partners, as intellect and intuition are united in creative art. The noblest music, most satisfying poetry, are neither the casual results of uncriticized inspiration, nor the deliberate fabrications of the brain, but are born of the perfect fusion of feeling and of thought. For the greatest and most fruitful minds are those which are rich and active on both levels, which are perpetually raising blind impulse to the level of conscious purpose, uniting energy with skill, and thus obtaining the fiery energies of the instinctive life for the highest uses. So, too, the spiritual life is only seen in its full worth and splendor, when the whole man is subdued to it, and one object satisfies the utmost desires of heart and mind. The spiritual impulse must not be allowed to become the center of a group of specialized feelings, a devotional complex, in opposition to, or at least alienated from, the intellectual and economic life. It must, on the contrary, brim over, invading every department of the self. When the mind's loftiest and most ideal thought, its conscious vivid aspiration, has been united with the more robust qualities of the natural man, then, and only then, we have the material for the making of a possible saint. We must also remember that, important as our primitive and instinctive life may be, and we should neither despise nor neglect it, its religious impulses taken alone no more represent the full range of man's spiritual possibilities than the life of the hunting tribe or the African crawl represent his false social possibilities. We may and should acknowledge and learn from our psychic origins. We must never be content to rest in them. Though in many respects, mental as well as physical, we are animals still, yet we are animals with a possible future in the making, both corporate and individual, which we cannot yet define. All other levels of life assure us that the impulsive nature is peculiarly susceptible to education. Not only can the whole group of instincts which help self-fulfillment be directed to higher levels, united and subdued to a dominant emotional interest, but merely instinctive actions can, by repetition and control, be raised to the level of habit, and be given improved precision and complexity. This, of course, is a primary function of devotional exercises, training the first blind instinct for God to the complex responses to the life of prayer. Instinct is at best a rough and ready tool of life. Practice is required if it is to produce its best results. Observe, for instance, the poor efforts of the young bird to escape capture, and compare this with the finished performance of the parent. 79. Therefore, in estimating man's capacity for spiritual response, we must reckon not only his innate instinct for God, but also his capacity for developing this instinct on the level of habit, educating and using its latent powers to the best advantage. 
Especially on the contemplative side of life, education does great things for us, or would do, if we gave it the chance. Here, then, the rational mind and conscious will must play their part in that great business of human transcendence, which is man's function within the universal plan. It is true that the deep-seated human tendency to God may best be understood as the highest form of that outgoing instinctive craving of the psyche for more life and love which, on whatever level it be experienced, is always one. But some external stimulus seems to be needed if this deep tendency is to be brought up into consciousness, and some education if it is to be fully expressed. This stimulus and this education, in normal cases, are given by tradition, that is to say, by religious belief and practice, or they may come from the countless minor and cumulative suggestions which life makes to us, and which few of us have the subtlety to analyze. If these suggestions of tradition or environment are met by resistance, either of the moral or intellectual order, whilst yet the deep instinct for full life remains unsatisfied, the result is an inner conflict of more or less severity, and as a rule this is only resolved and harmony achieved through the crisis of conversion, breaking down resistances, liberating emotion, and reconciling inner craving with outer stimulus. There is, however, nothing spiritual in the conversion process itself. It has its parallel in other drastic readjustments to other levels of life, and is merely a method by which selves of a certain type seem best able to achieve the union of feeling, thought, and will necessary to stability. Now we have behind us and within us all humanity's funded instinct for the divine, all the racial habits and traditions of response to the divine, but its valid thought about the divine comes as yet to very little. Thus we see that the author of The Cloud of Unknowing spoke as a true psychologist when he said that a secret blind love pressing towards God held more hope of success than mere thought can ever do. For he may well be loved, but not thought. By love he may be gotten and holden, but by thought never. 80. Nevertheless, if that consistency of deed and belief which is essential to full power is to be achieved by us, every man's conception of the God whom he serves ought to be the very best of which he is capable. Because ideas which we recognize as partial or primitive have called forth the richness and devotion of other natures, we are not therefore excused from trying all things and seeking a reality which fulfills to the utmost our craving for truth and beauty, as well as our instinct for good. It is easy, natural, and always comfortable for the human mind to sink back into something just a little bit below its highest possible, on one hand to wallow in easy loves rest in traditional formulae, or enjoy a moving type of devotion, which makes no intellectual demand. On the other, to accept without criticism the skeptical attitude of our neighbors, and keep safely in the furrow of intelligent agnosticism. Religious people have a natural inclination to trot along on mediocre levels, reacting pleasantly to all the usual practices, playing down to the hopes and fears of the primitive mind, its childish craving for comfort and protection, its tendency to rest in symbols and spells, and satisfying its devotional inclinations by any long psalter unmindfully mumbled in the teeth. 81. And a certain type of intelligent people have an equally natural tendency to dismiss, without further worry, the traditional notions of the past. In so far as all this represents a slipping back in the racial progress, it has the character of sin. At any rate, it lacks the true character of spiritual life. Such life involves growth, sublimation, the constant and difficult redirection of energy from lower to higher levels, a real effort to purge motive, see things more truly, face and resolve the conflict between the deep instinctive and the newer rational life. Hence, those who realize the nature of their own mental processes sin against the light if they do not do with them their very best that they possibly can, and the penalty of this sin must be a narrowing of vision, an arrest. The laws of apperception apply with at least as much force to our spiritual as to our sensual impressions. What we bring with us will condition what we obtain. We behold that which we are, Royce Brooks said long ago, 82. 
The mind's content and its ruling feeling tone, say psychology, all its memories and desires, mingle with all incoming impressions, color them, and condition those which our consciousness selects. This intervention of memory and emotion in our perceptions is entirely involuntary, and explains why the devotee of any specific creed always finds in the pure immediacy of religious experience the special marks of his own belief. In most acts of perception, and probably too in the intuitional awareness of religious experience, that which the mind brings is bulkier, if less important than that which it receives, and only the closest analysis will enable us to separate these two elements. Yet this machinery of apperception, humbling though its realization must be to the eager idealist, does not merely confuse the issue for us, or compel us to agnosticism as to the true content of religious intuition. On the contrary, its comprehension gives us the clue to many theological puzzles, whilst its existence enables us to lay hold of supersensual experiences we should otherwise miss, because it gives to us a means of interpreting them. Pure immediacy as such is almost ungraspable by us. As man, not as pure spirit, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies. That is to say, he took to the encounter of the infinite, the finite machinery of sense. This limitation is ignored by us at our peril. The great mystics, who have sought to strip off all image and reach, as they say, the bare, pure truth, have merely become inarticulate in their effort to tell us what it was that they knew. A light I cannot measure, goodness without form, exclaims Jacopone de Todi, 83. The light of the world, the good shepherd, says St. John, bringing a richly furnished poetic consciousness to the vision of God, and at once gives us something on which to lay hold. Generally speaking, it is only in so far as we bring with us a plan of the universe that we can make anything of it, and only in so far as we bring with us some idea of God, some feeling of desire for Him, can we approach Him. So true is it that we do indeed behold that which we are, find that which we seek, receive that for which we ask. Feeling, thought, and tradition must all contribute to the full working out of religious experience. The empty soul facing an unconditioned reality may achieve freedom, but assuredly achieves nothing else. For though the self-giving spirit is abundant, we control our own powers of reception. This lays on each self the duty of filling the mind with the noblest possible thoughts about God, refusing unworthy and narrow conceptions, and keeping alight the fire of His love. We shall find that which we seek. Hence a richly stored religious consciousness, the lofty conceptions of the truth-seeker, the vision of the artist, the boundless charity and joy in life of the lover of his kind, really contribute to the fullness of the spiritual life, both on its active and on its contemplative side. As the self reaches the first degrees of the prayerful or recollected state, memory elements, released from the competition of realistic experience, enter the foreconscious field. Among these will be the stored remembrances of past meditations, reading, and experiences, all giving an effective tone conducive to new and deeper apprehensions. The pure in heart see God because they bring with them that radiant and undemanding purity, because the storehouse of ancient memories, which each of us inevitably brings to that encounter, is free from conflicting desires and images, perfectly controlled by this feeling tone. It is now clear that all which we have so far considered supports, from the side of psychology, the demand of every religion for a drastic overhaul of the elements of character, a real repentance and moral purgation as the beginning of all personal spiritual life. Man does not, as a rule, reach without much effort and suffering the higher levels of his psychic being. His old attachments are hard, complexes of which he is hardly aware must be broken up before he can use the forces which they enchain. He must then examine without flinching his impulsive life, and know what is in his heart before he is in a position to change it. The light which shows us our sins, says George Fox, is the light that heals us. All those repressed cravings, those quietly unworthy motives, those mean acts which we instinctively thrust into hiddenness and disguise or forget, must be brought to the surface and, in the language of psychology, abreacted, language of religion, confessed. 
the whole doctrine of repentance really hinges on this question of abreacting painful or wrongful experience instead of repressing it the broken and contrite heart is the heart of which the hard complexes have been shattered by sorrow and love and their elements brought up into consciousness and faced and only the self which has endured this can hope to be established in the free spirit it is a process of spiritual hygiene psychoanalysis has taught us the danger of keeping skeletons in the cupboards of the soul the importance of tracking down our real motives of facing reality of being candid and fearless in self-knowledge but the emotional color of this process when it is undertaken in the full conviction of the power and holiness of that life force which we have not used as well as we might and with a humble and loving consciousness of our deficiency our falling short will be totally different from the feeling state of those who conceive themselves to be searching for the merely animal sources of their mental and spiritual life meekness in itself says the cloud of unknowing is not else but a true knowing and feeling of man's self as he is for surely whoso might verily see and feel himself as he is should verily be meek therefore swink and sweat all that thou canst and mayest for to get thee a true knowing and feeling of thyself as thou art and then i trow that soon after that thou shalt have a true knowing and feeling of god as he is eighty four the essence then of repentance and purification of character consists first in the identification and next in the sublimation of our instinctive powers and tendencies their detachment from egoistic desires and dedication to new purposes we should not starve or repress the abounding life within us but relieving it of its concentration on the here and now give its attention and its passion a wider circle of interest over which to range a greater love to which it can consecrate its growing powers we do not yet know what the limit of such sublimation may be but we do know that it is the true path of life's advancement that already we owe to it our purest loves our loveliest visions and our noblest deeds when such feeling such vision and such act are united and transfigured in god and find in contact with his living spirit the veritable sources of their power then man will have resolved his inner conflict developed his true potentialities and live a harmonious because a spiritual life we end therefore upon this conception of the psyche as the living force within us a storehouse of ancient memories and animal tendencies yet plastic adaptable ever pressing on and ever craving for more life and more love only the life of reality the life rooted in communion with god will ever satisfy that hungry spirit or provide an adequate objective for its persistent onward push footnotes 74 cf watts echo personalities for several illustrations of this law 75 Livingston, Mary Slessor of Calabar, page 131. 76. The Cloud of Unknowing. 77. And very often did he say unto me, Bride and daughter, sweet art thou unto me, I love thee better than any other who is in the valley of Spoleto. The Divine Consolations of Blessed Angela of Foligno, page 160. 78. The Spirit, edited by B. H. Streeter page 93 79 cf b russell the analysis of mind 80 opposite chapter 6 81 cloud of unknowing 82 ricebrook the sparkling stone 83 lauda 91 84 opposite end of chapter 3